Okay, so let's continue discussing the structure uh, of Congress, meaning the various structures uh, created within Congress. Now, of course, we discovered that con constitutionally there's only uh, a few positions that are uh, the Constitution uh, establishes within Congress. All the other structures were created later by the members of Congress uh, because it's important to keep in mind that uh, Congress is its own master, right? Uh, there's no one who has power over Congress as such, but the members of Congress. So the House is run and organized by the members of the House. The Senate is run and organized by the members of the Senate. There's no outside factor that could, could uh, oblige them to do anything. Um, they themselves are their own rulers. Why? Because they are your representatives, yeah? And as such, they need to have this freedom this this basically unbridled freedom uh, to be your representatives and no other institution uh, should have power over them. Um, so we talked about um, the constitutional structuring of Congress with, you know, Speaker in the House and President and President Pro Tempore in the Senate. Uh, we talked about um, the party caucuses, yeah, the, you know, the, one of the first things that formed were parties to, well, one of the things that formed it in Congress were parties in order to um, uh, which formed to perform a function, meaning to be able to create uh, majorities to pass legislation and to act together so that they can pass uh, their common agenda. Um, we talked about committees, which are uh, uh, institutions formed by the House uh, or by the Senate, uh, it, respectively, uh, in the given House, uh, and which were formed, which are formed in order to perform functions of the, the given chamber. Uh, as I said, the actual work of the of the House and respectively of the Senate is done actually in the committees. And each of these committees being made of members of the given chamber and being specialized on uh, on the policy area in the case of the standing committees. We also talked about other types of committees like select committees, joint and conference committees. Uh, but back to this idea of, of organizing yourself, of creating various kinds of alliances, various kinds of coalitions, right? So it all starts from the, uh, from the, from the basic conundrum, from the basic challenge of any elected representative, that you as an elected representative are alone, yeah? Uh, and as a single elected representative, whether in the House or in the Senate, you don't have any power. Uh, because as bodies, these bodies can only pass a piece of legislation with a majority yet uh, of the members, yet no individual member of the House or of the Senate has the power to, uh, uh, um, to force any other member to do their will, to do their bidding. So how the compromise then is this, you know, as I said from, you know, even in the first section, we talked about the challenge of collective action, yeah? Um, uh, the dilemma of collective action. How do you get people to work together who are self-interested and where you don't have any means to constrain them to, to work with each other? Right, and and that's why. Uh, uh, b however, each of the individuals have an interest in forming such coalitions uh, of of gathering more than you know just one member. Um, uh, hopefully, forming a majority because each member knows that they themselves cannot do anything on their own. So you know. Yes, um, individual members of the House or the Senate don't have sp power over the others, as such, yeah, as members of the given chamber. However, they all know that they need the others, yeah? So there's this exchange of, uh, uh, again, of, um, you know, I, I uh, sort of agree to form, to, to join a club where there's a clear leadership and to play by the rules of the club and to f follow the leadership, right? In this case, the, let's say the uh, majority leader, minority leader, whatever it is, yeah? Because uh, in, the, in, a, in the interest of being able to work together as a group and to form a majority. Now, but we talked about party caucuses as, as ways of, of organizing the members of the House or of the Senate, uh, but that's not the only ways of organizing people because, you know, when you talk about party, um, uh, party caucuses or party conferences, right, you have in a two-party system, you have, you know, the Republicans, yeah, and they have the Democrats, and you have basically a dividing line here in the sense of this is based on party ideology, right? Party ideology. So based on the party ideology or party preference, 
you divide this group of people into two, yeah? But this is not the only way to divide people, right? Because they can, um, uh, they can have, uh, you can divide them, you can group them by other um, factors, right? Uh, even by other preferences. Let's say, if we would uh, do an opinion poll and how many of the Democrats and how many of the Republicans actually like dogs, yeah? And how many like cats better, right? So let's say dogs. Well, in the, uh, you know, when you go to the dogs, you see that actually there's a, you know, the number of, there's a number of Democrats who like dogs and there's a number of Republicans who like dogs, yeah? So both Democrats and Republicans like dogs. However, there are Democrats who don't like dogs. There are Republicans who maybe hate dogs or have cats and whatever, right? So if the dividing line is, the, if the criterion is dogs or not dogs, then you f constitute another group of people, right? This group of what? Dog lovers, yeah? Now the dog lovers group um, um, uh, intersects uh, the, uh, the division between parties or, or uh, bisects it or, or you know, uh, bridges, yeah? The division between parties. The point being that there are many ways of, of, of grouping people, not just by party, right? How about those people who are interested in hiking, yeah? There's another group. Again, you will see both Democrats and Republicans there, and so on, right? Why is this important? Because all of these aspects that I mentioned um, can be concerns, yeah? Can be, can be point, points of focus, let's say dogs, yeah? Well, I want to pass legislation to protect dogs or to regulate dog ownership or to make uh, treatment of dogs more humane, right? Well, in order to do anything, remember, I need to create a coalition, right? So if I'm going to form an organization of dog lovers in Congress, right? Because they're going to be my alliance, which will help me pass legislation on that issue. And these other alliances um, uh, will be, uh, we will call them, uh, well, not we, but they can be called, one of the ways they can be called is CMOs. Yeah, uh, CMOs are congressional member organizations. Congressional member organizations so are, are various kinds of organizations made of made of members of Congress, divided by uh, or organized along different lines. Lines that you know uh, intersect each other, um, uh, that bridge the other uh, other gaps. For example, the gaps between parties. And again, the only way to get things done is by forming coalitions and getting people to work with you, yeah? Uh, so we will look, um, um, and I posted the material for you uh, with the um, CMOs in the current Congress. Uh, so what we'll do is we will talk about various, we'll try to group these CMOs, there are more than 100, uh, in, in various categories. And uh, to, to, you know, based on how, along which lines they form, right? And then we'll try to find examples for each category, right? So the first CMO, right, we, we talk about, we know it's party-based CMO. That's basically the, you know, um, uh, is the given party caucus. Yeah, Republican Party caucus, Democratic Party caucus, as I said, they might also be um, uh, called conference, but, you know, let's just stick with caucus, yeah? And then... Um, just to form these broad categories, there can be identity-based uh, caucuses or characteristics. Yeah? Well, for example, what? You have African Americans in both, uh, um, uh, in both um, parties. You have Latino uh, people in both parties, and they might have a, a common interest that they need, want to pursue as Latino people, or as African Americans, or as, or as women, yeah? Um, various, you know, whatever identity, um, and um, there's women in both parties, there's African Americans in both parties, the same with the Latino, yeah? So their interest, which uh, emerges from or comes from their identity or characteristics, um, bridges the gap, the party gap, between the two major parties. Uh, and, and in order to, to, to pursue uh, interests uh, specific to this group, to their identity uh, or characteristics, um, they will form such uh, CMOs. 
then we can um, classify a third category uh, based on which form based on policy in, uh, um, orientation. Uh, I'm going to give you two, uh, two examples. I'm going to ask you to find examples, but the two traditional examples, one of which is still around, is the Blue Dog Caucus. It's an old one, established one, which is basically <coughs> a CMO, uh, which is basically the uh, made of fiscally uh, conservative Democrats. Yeah, uh, and there used to be a Tea Party Caucus. No, not anymore. Yeah. Uh, which which groups of people who kind of although they were elected into Congress uh, mostly on Republican, you know, as Republicans within the Republican Party they formed a more narrow group, yeah, um, and that's what these CMOs are. You know, you might um, uh, be united, you might be closer to someone. Uh, from the other party on that issue than to someone from your party, right? Because you, your colleague from your party hates dogs, but your colleague from the other party actually loves exactly the same dogs that you love and has the same idea. So on that issue, you and they can work together because not everything is divided by party. Um, and, and another thing to note here about Blue Dog Caucus and Tea Party Caucus and how do we differentiate these CMOs from, for example, the party-based ones, which is also, you know, ideology-based ones. Well, a good way of thinking about it is um, to, to, to recall the fact that each party is what? That each party is a coalition of factions, yeah? And... Yeah, it's an umbrella party. But as an umbrella party, it will contain members from the sort of uh, more ideological extremes or, 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 or ends, yeah? And also more centrist members. The same with the other party. It will contain members from various factions, because that's the point of a party, you know, two-party system, is to be an umbrella all-encompassing party and to uh, link together and to get the, all these different di and differing fractions to work with each other. Well, that's not very easy, especially in times of increased fragmentation and polarization, as we would arguably have today. But uh, in, if you use this, this, uh, uh, you know, this design, this understanding, then you know the Tea Party will be. So, you know, let's say this is right and this is left. Uh, the Tea Party would be somewhere here, yeah. The Tea Party Caucus, yeah, because they represent this faction of the Republican Party, while the more centrist part of the of the Democrats were were here, yeah, because they were the what? They were the um, uh, Blue Dog Coalition. Uh, the more fiscally conservative Democrats, that's more center center uh, left. That's more uh, balanced. That's more towards the center. Yeah. So think of these then of these policy or uh, ideology based um, uh, caucuses, uh, CMOs of of people united by um, a more narrow uh, set of ideas than the uh, uh, than the general you know uh, umbrella party agenda. Yeah. <clears throat> so. I'm part of the Democratic Party, but I specifically represent this sort of a, <coughs> a set of ideas that are more specific. Okay, and they're important enough so that we, and again, because we think the same way, whether we are in the extreme or in the middle, uh, the only way, uh, you know, the only thing we can do is to get together and try to, to, to help each other then pass legislation or influence legislation that fits our idea, our ideology, right? Whether it's Tea Party or it's a center-left, you know, blue dog uh, coalition or whatever it is, yeah? Uh, the point of forming these CMOs once, once again and over and over again is that everything that needs to be done in Congress, in the elected body, can only be done by getting other people to work with you. Now, Right, if you're a climber and the other guy is a climber and you're from different parties, you have actually common platform about climbing, and you can both work hard to get some legislation passed about climbing, and uh, with not even, you know, because that's what drives you, and you know, the parties as such have no say in this because um, uh, they don't have a platform on climbing, probably. Yeah, so um, uh, or you're just trying to push the party in one direction, like the Tea Party, yeah, uh, to push it more towards the extreme, to make it more pure ideologically, and and so on. So anyway, it's a 
the, these caucuses based on policy and ideology are, are smaller, um, sort of think of them as more specific and smaller di directions within, um, within the, the given party um, and, and who form a caucus in order to be able to pursue their specific vision. Okay, and then, um, so policy ideology and then issues and interests. And, you know, this might be actually the most widespread type um, kind of party, uh, kind of CMO, sorry. Yeah. So let's look at an example of, of all kinds of CMOs. And as I said, you should be able to, to give an example of um, each category from, from this list, uh, from the list that I'm uh, posting on uh, Blackboard. Um, so... If you look at this specific list that I have right now in front of me, oops. what do I see? Yeah, first of all, there are many, many 88 pages, right, of, <laughs> of CMOs, yes. So, um, uh, so let's see where will we situate each of these uh, uh, CMOs. Like Agriculture Research Caucus, clearly it would be like an issues and interest uh, CMO. Now, this is interesting, Ahmadiyya Muslim Caucus. Now clearly this is an identity characteristics based caucus because guess what, there's Muslims in both, uh, uh, um, uh, both parties, yeah? Uh, Air Cargo Caucus, issues and interest. Albanian issues, ca issues caucus. Um, this, you know, you will see many CMOs it's a typical thing for CMOs to um, um, to many of them to be basically U.S. and some other country relations CMO, and whether it has to do with you know some of representatives for whatever reason being connected, maybe ethnically, maybe historically, and their ancestry with that country, or maybe it is just because they visited when they were students and fell in love with that country. So, so basically, these are CMOs of of um, representatives, yeah, and senators who have uh, who have a specific interest in a given country, and there are many of these things. So, as I said, Albanian issues caucus. I think that's what is the case. Ameri um, American Sikh Congressional Caucus. Well, the Sikh, as you, as you know or might not know, is an <coughs> ethnic and religious group from India. Uh, they wear uh, traditional attire and a specific kind of turban and. Um, so, you know, again, you have six, theoretically, both in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and they have some specific interests. Um, Arthritis Caucus, yeah, again, an issues and interest caucus. Um, what should I, what should we? Uh, bipartisan Women's Caucus, yeah, there you go. So there you go, the um, a CMO clearly based on identity and characteristics, right? Um, and as I said, these are the, the most the most widespread though are, are the ones on issues and interests. Like for example, look, bipartisan ski and snowboard caucus. Well, that's that's cool. Um, bipartisan task force to end sexual violence. There's something. The Bulgaria caucus. That's a good example of of um, as I said, one of those. Well, issues and interest based uh, CMOs that have to do with the relationship between the U.S. and a specific country. And, and it's always good to ask, so why are those representatives so interested in serving the interests of that given country? Um, not because of you know, some, something dubious or nefarious, but it's like, okay, so what is it? Is, do you like the culture? Is it where your parents were from? Or it's just other experiences? California Coastal Caucus, and on and on. Campus free speech, black Jewish relations, Bay of Hashem. So, to repeat them, yeah, to recall, there are party based, yeah, the Republican and the Democrat, there's the identity or characteristics based, yeah. Um, there's a policy based, uh, meaning um, policy orientation, ideology. Uh, I gave a few examples from real life, 
and for issues and interest, again, very widely spread. Uh, many of them are based, formed around specific issues and interests. As I said, they can range from the wilderness flowers of the American West, yeah, some, you know, and you will have warmer or markers from both sides who are interested in protecting those flowers to, to whatever, you know. Um, so, so whatever, you know, unites you, whatever. And again, um, uh, as an individual member of the House or of the Senate, you have no power, yeah. Uh, so what you will have to quickly learn is that the key to success is to create coalitions to work with others. However, you cannot pursue them to work with you. So um, what you can do is to trade favors and so on, or to find common agendas and, uh, you know, then make sure that you pass those pieces of legislation, or at least push for those pieces of legislation that correspond to your agenda. Um, Okay, so that about uh, CMOs, but as, as, a, as a sort of a summarizing thing, think about the fact that uh, you get, you know, to the Washington all, you know, um, enthusiastic and, will, and promising to change the world. And when you get there, you realize that you're just one in the many. And you realize that in order to do anything done, literally any single thing, yeah, you need to work with others, yeah. And that is the conundrum. That is the conundrum, that is the, and in order to be able to do that, work with others or convince them to work with you, any point of view can represent uh, um, an advantage. Any, and any position that you might get in any, any, let's say, a committee will be a bargaining chip. So since you don't have anything to force other members of Congress to do your will, what you do is you play, you, you join your party, maybe climb in the ranks. Um, then you join a committee, climb in the ranks there as well. You, you, you basically um, play, will take responsibility for things in Congress, yeah? Uh, what every single uh, position that you'll obtain will be a bargaining chip for you. Because let's say you're from a district where, you know, um, there's an issue about energy, but the district is not dominated by this issue. So you're not on the Committee on Energy, yeah? You're on the Committee on Agriculture and a Committee on, uh, you know, uh, Veterans Affairs, yeah? Um, however, there's an issue in your, in your the back home district about energy. So what do you do? What do you do? Because you don't, you're not on the committee that will discuss energy bills and in a house that matters a lot because if you're not on the right committee, you basically have no say in shaping that legislation. Well, um, this is where you use your other positions, like maybe on the uh, dog caucus or maybe on the, uh, which is more moderate, let's say, uh, maybe on the, the agriculture committee to promise your support to, to people who are in the committee on uh, uh, tax, uh, you know, on whatever it was, the other thing, energy, yeah. Um, so you're not on the energy committee, but you say, hey, I need this, I need this thing passed for my district. If you help me with this, uh, I'm going to help you when you're going to need something having to do with agriculture. So every position, that's my point here, that every position uh, is, and everything, any all these structures that we talked about are, are tools, become tools uh, and bargaining chips, yeah? Uh, because everybody needs everybody, yeah? But the more you have, the more they need you, yeah? Okay, um, good. So we talked about various ways of organizing the members of the Congress, uh, but let's talk about um, another aspect and, and other group of people that you see in Congress, which is the group that in many ways does the actual work of Congress on a daily basis, and especially the nitty gritty work. And I'm talking about staff. And by staff, I mean professional people hired to do certain jobs in the service of the representatives. But you need, again, here I need to call, call, call to your attention the fact that 
power in the house only belongs to the members of the house. No entity, no administration, no members of a, not, a, you know, an office, whatever in the house is more powerful than the actual members of the house. Now, there's a leader uh, in the par each party and there's a party organization, so, so but, but the, you join these parties because you will have benefits from it. As such, nobody can force you to do anything. But you play along with them on many things so that you can pass one thing for yourself, yeah, and for your district, yeah. Um, so, so um, committees then, uh, so, so the members then are the most powerful things in the House and in the Senate. Members of uh, representatives are bosses of themselves, uh, senators are bosses of themselves. Never forget this. Staff, whoever they hire, yeah, the, who, to, to work for them, are just tools and instruments, yeah. They are. They will become tremendously important and impactful in the sense of they do the they do the legwork, they do the nitty gritty work. Uh, we and and um, you know basically for the elected representatives, yeah. But don't fall in the trap of of you know you're going to learn about some of these staff ways of organizing the staff in the in the Congress, and and uh, uh, don't at any point assume that the any form of organization of staff will be more powerful than even one elected representative. Uh, because constitution, because staff is just a tool, yeah, uh, instrument for the representatives to do well or to do whatever they want uh, with the help of staff. Okay, so when we talk about staff, there's many kinds of staff and um, attached to many aspects of Congress. I'm going to focus just on a few major as a few major things, um, and uh, we're going to talk about the staff of representatives. Yeah. Well, just like in in, a, in election, uh, in the campaigning process, each uh, representative they didn't campaign on their own, right? They created a staff, a campaign staff. They hired people who knew how to do campaigning, who knew how to manage a campaign, how to fundraise, how to coordinate communication, and on and on and on. Um, so you, you had a campaign organization that actually did the work of campaigning for you. You were the CEO, the leader, the manager of that campaign organization. Same here, right? But uh, when you get to D.C., you're going to have to do, well, everything that we expect from Congress to do, basically, if you put it, you know, sort of simplify it, we expect it from every single uh, representative to do uh, with regards to their district. So to represent, to legislate, to execute oversight, to handle everything, um, uh, you know, that we imagine they, they, they should handle. Um, so how can any representative do that? In what hours of the day could, would they be able to do, uh, to do that? There's, there's not enough resources, yeah? And this is why staff exists. So the representative have their own office, so the staff, their own staff, yeah? How, and part of the staff comes from actually the uh, campaign organization, yeah? Yeah, those who have helped you win the election, yeah, you're going to take them with you to, to, to D.C. because they believe in you, they're your, your, your trust, people who you trust to, to get things done, right? Um, so, so you're going to take them with you because they were the ones that provided you your success. Remember, a representative and a senator or a senator, they're like political entrepreneurs. And their staff they, and, uh, is their, their, their business, basically, right? That's their small business. Uh, and they're managing this staff uh, and, and to produce, you know, all the things that a representative or Congress needs to produce, to legislate, to uh, uh, exercise oversight, la, la, la. Um, but in this, uh, but so much so that each representative becomes then what a sort of a CEO of a mini political business, yeah? Because that's what American politicians are: mini political businessmen, mini political entrepreneurs, whose business, whose, whose organization that they lead is their staff, and they're just the managers. And the staff is is the one is the entity that does the legwork, does all the work. And then, so you get to D.C., so you brought part of your campaign organization, but also you want to get D.C. specialists, people from D.C., yeah? Um, people from there, people who maybe have worked on Capitol Hill, meaning in Congress before, maybe for other congressmen, and, and, uh, or people who are just, you know, there and know how things work, 
you're going to hire a bunch of those, and these will form your staff in DC because, uh, again, as I said, everything you need to do, there's no time in the day to do it, so the, the staff will help you do it. Uh, so that's a staff in DC. Don't, re uh, uh, don't forget, however, that the district also Uh, the district also has its own staff. So, meaning uh, part of your cam uh, campaign organization that you will, what I'm saying is that you will always keep a home base, yeah? You will have your staff in Washington, D.C., in Congress, and it's usually sizable. And you also will keep a, an office at home, which we will also populate with your staff, also starting from the campaign organization. So, you know, if you had a successful campaign organization, you part of those people will join, will you will take to D.C., and part of them will remain at home to, to, to run your organization at home. Because, remember, you, you running your organization at home, you returning every weekend to shake hands uh, and kiss babies and to cut ribbons and whatever nonsense is your way of doing what? Of non-stop campaigning, yeah? Because the moment you get elected, you need to start campaigning for the next election. Um, and the district staff helps you, you know, respond to the local population. The DC staff, again, sh they do partially that and partially they help you navigate, well, DC, uh, Washington, DC, power and, and Congress itself. Okay, so these are the staff of representatives. It's a good way of getting also into politics is, you know, let's say you're making uh, students who are doing their graduate work in American politics in D.C. That's another way of um, entering politics is by joining one of these staffs as a lowly, you know, sort of intern. Yeah, uh, and there's some famous names that in American politics that started their career as interns of, on the Capitol Hill. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, it, 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 you know, oh, and being on a staff because you're the, because it's a staff of representatives that actually does all the work of representative from negotiating with other representatives, staff, uh, or writing bills, designing bills, doing analysis, and so on. Uh, and, and because uh, working in this position puts you right at the heart of the institution and you know everything that's going on because guess what? Most of it is done by you, yeah? Staff is very, uh, experience on, in Congress as a staff member is a very valuable asset that many staff will use after they retire uh, by selling out their, um, these, the, this experience yeah, to various organizations or institutions that are interested in having an inkling of what's happening within Congress. Um, so, you know, you go to D.C., you work in Congress, and then when you stop working, you resign or whatever, you leave, you're not going to have a lot of problems finding a job because people want uh, to hire you in D.C., P people from, let's say, lobbying organizations and so on. They, their target people uh, whom they want to hire you in, in D.C. are people who have worked in Congress and know how to manipulate, well, how to use Congress. So, you know, Joining staff is a is one of the most important things you can do for your career, as a, a, a you know because it's like an investment in your future because it's that know how that kind of know how is unique. Okay, where else do we have fine uh, fine staff? Well, we find staff around the committees, yeah, because again, committees are members of Congress who get together, uh, you know, on um, but you know they get together to do certain things, uh, mostly to vote, mostly to take some decisions, but then they move on to the other jobs that they have. Although each member is also in several committees, but then there's also voting on the floor, and then there's all these things that need to be done. So committees, um, especially I'm referring to the standing committees as, as committees right here. Um, so in the standing committee, uh, each standing committee being uh, focused on one policy area, uh, the staff itself that they hire will be professionals who, they, uh, who can help the committee does, do, do its job uh, because they are from that specific uh, field. Yeah? So let's say there is um, 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 an issue regarding um, you know, energy or whatever, right? Uh, the members of the committee might be from states that uh, you know have um, 
uh, oil reserves and um, where oil industry is big, and they might even strike it big. Uh, uh, but um, uh, that doesn't mean that they are specialists in energy, yeah, uh, like scientists or so. So uh, they join a committee on energy, but the people, you, in order for you to be able to go into the nitty gritty, you hire specialists, you hire professionals. That's kind of the staff of these committees. And the more they stay on these committees, uh, work for these committees, and they work day and night for that committee, right? So the staff of a committee works just for that committee. Committee on Energy has a staff with specialists on energy and so on, right? So they are a huge help to, to representatives who are not specialists in a field, but they are interested in passing legislation on a field. So staff here, yeah, committee staff. And committee staff is, uh, is a, a bipartisan, yeah, so you have uh, uh, staff uh, associated with representatives from both parties or um, depending on, you know, how they're hired or um, they, um, um, they can be nonpartisan. And then there are um, congressional offices. Now, this is, um, these are offices of, made of staff, again, staff, who perform some crucial functions in, 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 in Congress. Um, and they were constituted specifically to, to help Congress perform its duties, uh, as, as you will see. So, for example, the one is the Congressional Research Office, CRS. This is a um, staff organization that has about a thousand employees, and what it does is basically research, yeah, research for Congress, uh, meaning it's it's nonpartisan, yeah, nonpartisan. So these are people hired to research on various issues, uh, uh, to provide information and research to either to individual representatives or to committees. Yeah. So let's say there's a big one of the big issues is on uh, the rise of some extremist organization in Southeast Asia. Uh, what is this organization? Who knows? I don't know. So the committee on you know homeland security, and there's another committee on foreign affairs, and there's whatever they need to. To, to make some legislation to address this issue because it might become a terrorist organization and attack the U.S. and blah, blah, blah. They will ask the CRS to produce some, some papers, some green papers, some white papers, meaning some research, yeah, some solid research in, that goes in-depth into what in the world is this new thing. Yeah? That's what CRS does. C and it's good for you to also remember their name because when you write papers or you do, you, you, you know, let's say in the future or whatever you do, you want to learn more about the subject, this is a good source and a valid, legitimate source to, to, to get solid, info well-researched information, the CRS. Yeah? So you can always quote it with confidence because this is serious research. This is not, you know, Googling. Um, so there's a Congressional Research Office, uh, Research Service. Why did I say office? And then there's the Congressional Budget Office, CBO. And again, remember, these are all what? Staff organization, meaning they're all there to be tools of the representatives, yeah, and, or of the senators, yeah. They provide information, they provide consultancy, they provide assistance, yeah. Um, they have no power, these organizations of staff, because staff doesn't have power. As I said, the only thing that has power in Congress are the members of Congress, because they're the only ones elected. So the budget of CBO has about 250 employees, and as you can imagine, it's made of specialists in, uh, you know, basically budgeting and expenditures, revenue and expenditure, and estimating costs and, and whatever. Uh, so fin finance um, and uh, expenses. Um, why is this important? Because, you know, um, let's say someone wants to introduce a piece of legislation and says, hey, let's introduce this program. And by the way, we should do it because it's not going to cost us anything. It's basically going to save us money. Uh, this is a perfectly fine program that, well, that's nice. The people who, the person who is pushing for the program will say this. The person maybe opposed to the program will say, no, 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 this is a disaster. It's going to cost $10 billion and whatever. Well, the CBO is there to, to, to provide 
nonpartisan uh, uh, estimates on, for example, certain programs. So it will tell you what actually the program will not save you money. It's actually going to cost money, but it's not going to be 120, 100 billion dollars. It's going to be just 100 million dollars, right? So that's what CBO does. Now it's a tool. It's an instrument. Sometimes representatives want to use it, uh, use it, and sometimes they uh, use it just to, uh, you know, to criticize the other side, meaning to say, hey, you have. Um, uh, underestimated the cost of this policy project or whatever it is. Yeah, the point is that CBO is a non-partisan, independent, objective, not independent, but objective body of of, of experts who can provide uh, information regarding you know estimations of budget of costs and so on to to Congress. But the members of Congress might uh, are free to um, uh, sort of follow their um, uh, suggestions or to take them. Their, their estimates seriously or not. Because at the end of the day, staff doesn't have any power. It's the members of Congress has power. And then there's another one, the Government Accountability Office. And this has to do with the other uh, GAO. The other fun function of uh, Congress, Congress having three functions, right? Representation, legislation, oversight. This has to do with oversight. But just to understand the, the, the dimensions of, of, of the challenge of oversight, which we will talk about, uh, by the way, in more detail um, soon. Um, I Let's, you know, sort of understand, begin to understand that by... Um, considering the following. Congress has the role and the only is the only institution that has, has the power to pass legislation, meaning to create a program, meaning from now on we will do this thing. Yeah? And the two chambers pass a legislation saying from now on we'll do this thing and it goes to the president who signs it. And what? Then it needs to be implemented. Now, implementation is done by human beings. We talk about institutions, yeah? A group of people who do the same time day after day, yeah? Well, let's say Congress creates, oh, that's created by the post office, but let's say Congress creates a post office. They pass a piece of legislation saying, from now on there shall be a post office and a, and a whole structure of post offices, and they will uh, 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 transmit mailing, yeah? That is the project, that is the policy that is, is created, yeah? In the, for the good of the whole, the whole or whatever. Now, that's a piece of text. That text, that those words will not become reality unless, yeah? That we create what? A body of people who will do what that policy says needs to be done. Who from now on, day in, day out, will do what? They will deliver mail, they will transport mail, they will transfer mail, and so on. So the, the, the words mean nothing unless they're implemented. And implementation happens within the executive. This is the head of the executive, and this is the, what we call the federal administration. Yeah, the federal administration, which are all these departments, because for any piece of legislation that I create, there's another institution I need to form to what? To do it, to make it real. To make it real not just one time, because I say, okay, from now on, we will protect the coastlines with a Coast Guard. Well, then I need to create a Coast Guard, meaning an institution, where people will do the same thing day after day. Remember our definition of an institution. Yeah? Now, Congress has been around for 200 years and so, um, and more. Um, they have passed many pieces of legislation. In order for any of all of those pieces of legislation to become real, they needed to establish what? To create, to give that task to a group of people, maybe even hire this group of people, and to give them the resources and the money and the place where to live and work and the offices and whatever to do that thing that they created, yeah? So my point is that throughout this, you know, the, the past 200 years, we started expecting more and more from the federal government that they do more and more. Well, who is they? That's Congress. And for Congress doing is to pass a piece of legislation saying from now on, we shall do this. But we shall do this meaning this, this shall be done. Uh, but this shall be done means that once this, this text becomes law, I need to establish 
a group of people who will do this, that thing from day, day, day in and day out. Which means that all the hundreds and thousands of plan projects that have been passed, uh, you know, you have now millions of people and thousands and hundreds of, of offices, all of them doing what Congress, yeah, has told them to do, implementing those ideas, those policies, those pieces of legislation. So my point is that this, this, is, this is what, you know, the Federal Administration, yeah, which is part of the executive branch, yeah, um, has, has grown immensely. There's millions of people employed here, tens of thousands of programs, yeah. That exists because Congress created the law because, uh, to, to, to do something, and these are the things that were created to do that thing, yeah. Well, Congress has the role to represent basically represent needs and respond to needs, then pass legislation to respond to those needs, yeah? And that's it, yeah? Representation, legislation. And then, once it's passed, it's the executive's role to implement. But Congress also has a third role, what? To oversee, yeah, whether or not these things that they created and told them to do are actually done right. But how can 435 people here and 100 people here who are doing all the other things we have talked about, from campaigning to fundraising to being in committees and to writing legislation and representing and talking to constituency, how can they do, how can they have oversight over more several million people? Yeah? That is the conundrum of oversight. And one of the tools that Congress created to respond to this conundrum, to respond to this challenge, is, as I said, the Government Accountability Office. And this is also why it is one of the largest offices with about 3,500 uh, staff members, yeah? whose day in and day out job is to make sure, to, 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 to help Congress um, fulfill their job and responsibility of oversight, of checking that the executive is doing what Congress told them to do. Yeah? Because, uh, um, so, and even so, right? You're saying 3,500 3, people. Well, that's a lot. Well, even so, given the immense complexity of the executive, yeah, of the uh, federal administration and its history and all this accumulated historical institutional, uh, you know, ballast, yeah, they're only going to do, you know, the superficial things, the, the, the reporting, the yearly reporting, because nobody has the uh, know-how and the tools to go into the, you know, daily work. Is this uh, employee of the federal administration, are they, you know, using the pencils correctly or something, yeah? You can't go in such depth. You kind of have to look at the big picture. Um, uh, but anyway, this, as I said, this GAO was created by Congress in order to help them fulfill their function of oversight on a more day-to-day -day basis, because otherwise, members of Congress, like individuals or in committees, they would, you know, do that oversight, but in a more sporadic way, in a more happenstance way, maybe in a more uh, sort of, when, so when something breaks down, then I will pay attention, sort of a thing, yeah? Because that's the only moment when I actually know that something is wrong because I cannot oversee hundreds or uh, tens of thousands of people, what they do, yeah? Anyway, so that's the GAO. As I said, it's one of the most, um, I said 3,500, uh, well, or 3,000, um, 3, or anyway, or 3,500, that's fine. Um, but that's, that's the point of the GAO, is to have Congress perform its function of oversight. Okay. Um, that's that's it about uh, uh, these um, staff. Of course, there's much more staff in Congress. There's the Capitol Police. There's this and that. The whole thing that you know. Uh, there's other institutions that belong to Congress, as I said, like the library, the printing presses, the whatever. All those people, all those offices and institutions are populated by staff. But I wanted to focus on these specific uh, locations for staff, which is the staff of representatives, the staff of committees, and the staff of congressional offices, because they play a huge role and a central role in actually Congress doing what they're supposed to do, which is representation, legislation, and oversight. Speaking of legislation, um, the next thing to do would be to sort of go over the lawmaking process, the process of passing laws, making and passing laws. Um, uh, so 
you know how 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 does it happen yeah and and with this occasion that this will help us also to connect the individual dots individual institutions that we have been covering and talking about in this you know in the past two uh, or three uh, classes um, namely all these uh, you know um, organizations forms of structuring congress uh, so to speak so let's look at the stages of the lawmaking process yeah um, and to do that just to synthesize right again um, remember that the lawmaking power is exclusively given to Congress right um, and what does this mean to make a law there's an idea yeah that becomes a bill that becomes a law and then there is it implemented yeah implemented implementation ideas can come from wherever yeah but bill meaning a project of law project a project of law, a, a proposed law text yeah introducing a bill and transforming it into a law taking that idea and transforming it into a law this is a power reserved to congress only congress can introduce ideas yeah in the form of a proposed text and has the, have the power to, to, for them to become legislation. And then this legislation will need to be implemented by the what? The executive, yeah? The executive branch, yeah? And this is the legislative branch, right? Congress, yeah? This is the job of Congress, yeah? The, the job and the power to make rules for your life, right? Um, and that's the part that we're going to look at, yeah? So um, let's look at them at the stages of, of, of lawmaking based on this sort of a broad structure, yeah? One is the origin of a, of a bill, yeah? Origin of a, of a piece of legislation, yeah? Um, so first of all, they all originate as an idea, yeah? And then they need to be put on the agenda, meaning on the list of priorities that Congress will actually be forced to deal with, yeah? Uh, the agenda of Congress, meaning the list of tasks that they will try to fulfill, yeah? So let's look first at, at idea. Where do ideas, where can ideas come from, you know, you know, ideas for a law? How do they know what to deal with, yeah? Where do ideas come from? Well, if you think about them, yeah, where could where do ideas? How how do they know what to deal with? Yeah, well, obviously there are many you know sources for ideas. Yeah, the representatives or or Congress people. Yeah, the members of Congress themselves are sources of ideas. They all have their own ideas. Wherever they have gotten those ideas, yeah, that they will try to push forward. Yeah, but obviously a lot of these will come from the district from their constituency yeah yeah meaning needs of the people you're supposed to represent yeah other will come from organized interests whether or not it's from your district or not right so the you know the all the farmers organization the unions the uh, chamber of commerce the whatever you know the college of doctor of, of physicians whatever they can Organized interests who can say, hey, in our field, this is a need to do something about it. This is when they come to your door and knock and, uh, and say, hey, why don't you pass a piece of legislation on this issue? Because we need it. Now, here, obviously, the balance between do they actually need it or will they just benefit them is a different thing. So, okay, where else can ideas come from? Well, one of the most, uh, so how do we know what, what, what are priorities, right? Because, you know, um, People think many things, right? And but clearly, certain things are picked up and made prominent. And in this process, the media plays an important role, right, in bringing certain things to prominence and sort of making a huge hula baloo out of it. Yeah. And then they have you have to respond to that. Um, then there can be simply the pressure of events that just happen and and cr uh, create priorities, right? 9/11 was not on anyone's sort of planned, you know, list of ideas or whatever, but once it happened, it created its own set of priorities. And, 
Of course, who can, where else can ideas come from of, of, for legislation? Um, uh, in, in, in effect, as you well know, a lot of ideas where we kind of expect this, this position, this person to bring a lot of ideas to Congress is basically the president, U.S. president, yeah? Um, which is weird because the U.S. president has no power to introduce any bill into Congress. Uh, this is contrary, this is opposite to what, for example, um, the, the way things work in a parliamentary system, like the UK has a different political system, different arrangement, where most of the bills passed by the legislature are actually introduced by the federal, by the executive, and uh, there's no separation between the two, um, uh, as, and the most, most of the bills passed by the legislature are those uh, brought in by the executive. So the executive becomes one of the most important policy makers and legislative uh, actors. Not here. As I said, the only person who can introduce a piece of legislation in Congress is a member of Congress. Only Congress has the power to pass, make and pass legislation. So the president can bring something up, but as we know, the president has a unique function and power in the United States, which, is, which stem, uh, stems from his visibility. Yeah, and his prominence in the eyes of the public. And that's why it's because of this unique prominence and visibility of the position um, uh, that people pay attention and inevitably then whatever the president brings up becomes an issue to be debated, an issue to deal with. Um, and, um, and there can be obviously, oh, and the party, of course. Yeah, the party, you know, Policy priorities, yeah. They also have, you know, oh, we need to do this. The Republican Party is united by a set of ideas, yeah, a set of principles, a set of, uh, same with the Democrats, a set of goals, yeah. So ideas come from what the party itself, which forms the majority or the minority, wants to achieve. Okay, well, ideas can come from many places, yeah, um, but how do they become... How, how they put on the agenda, meaning who decides what or which of these ideas will be picked up and which of these ideas will be dealt with. Um, and which of, so what should we pass legislation on? You know, um, so here different actors play an important role. Again, here the party plays a huge role because it was formed in order to create a common agenda, let's say for the given uh, session of Congress, the given year of Congress, and uh, to, the whole purpose of a party is to get people behind the common agenda, to have an agenda and to get them behind them and to pass it. And the failure or success of political party and of party leaders in Congress actually is closely tied to the perception of whether or not they were able to, 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 to govern, yeah? to actually do what they promised they would do. Um, and remember that people have very little patience with politicians. So parties, that's their job, to create an agenda. Um, then here again, the president, uh, so again, uh, um, the, the president, um, has no power to put it on the actual agenda of Congress, yeah, in the sense of forcing members of Congress to 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 uh, deal with anything. However, because of the overwhelming visibility and, and unique position of the president, um, often the Members of Congress themselves want the president to pick up certain ideas because once he or she, you know, picks this idea up, it becomes, an, uh, it might become an, a very popular uh, uh, idea, meaning the president picking up an idea makes it hugely visible in a unique way and creates a, a national debate, yeah? Uh, which creates basically a huge faction of people who are for that idea and another faction who are against that idea. But that force, so by virtue of picking it up, the president puts an idea on the agenda because he creates, sort of, he takes leadership of, 
uh, of, of pushing forward this idea. Although, in fact, the president cannot force Congress to do anything. Yeah? But if they're in friendly relations, the, the members of Congress can use the president to, to, to push forward certain uh, uh, agenda items. Or the president can sort of blackmail Congress to pick up certain um, um, ideas because the president comes in front of the people and says, we need to do this. Congress, why aren't you doing anything? Yeah? And if he's right or if, it's, you know, if he touches a nerve with the population, the Congress has, not, you know, has no chance but to deal with that issue because otherwise they would suffer a huge you know, backlash from the public only because the public only pays attention to the presidency. So the party uh, caucuses, yeah, the party caucus plays a huge uh, role, the president um, to shape uh, the agenda, then the speaker versus um, the majority leader. Um, well, the speaker um, in the House and the majority leader in the Senate they also play a role in, in, in driving the, um, uh, the agenda and, and creating the agenda. Well, more the Speaker in the House than in the Senate, it's actually the majority leader and the minority leader who play a role in, um, in, the, in, in, in establishing what are we going to talk about this uh, session. Yeah, that's, that's part of the role in that given chamber, to, to create a list of priorities so that people don't just run around like headless chicken. Okay, so that's about agenda setting, yeah? Um, and we can think of other um, sources as well. Oh, other ideas can come from executive agencies. Meaning whatever department in the executive in the, in the federal administration that I, you know, we, as we mentioned, there are many, you know, Department of Agriculture, this and that. They're the ones who implement legislation. They're also the ones who give you feedback on whether or not that uh, legislation uh, functions, whether or not that institution functions anymore, right? So we have created this program to give, you know, I don't know, funding, help to peanut growers in, uh, you know, the southern, southwestern states. Uh, and uh, this office has been doing that for two years now, and now they're at a point where they realize that this, this program doesn't work anymore. It needs to be changed seriously or something. That's when they, they can come back and give feedback, yeah, as members of the executive to, the, to, to Congress and to tell them, hey, that law that you passed is no longer actually helping, yeah. That's, that's, so that's oversight, feedback, uh, as part of oversight from executive agencies, yeah. Okay, what's the second step? Um, this is Senate. Let's say uh, an idea came up, it was put on the agenda by the party with the help of the speaker in the House and the majority leader in the Senate and also the minority leader. What, what's the process of actually introducing the bill? What, well, first of all, it needs to be introduced. As I said, only member of given chamber can introduce a bill. Yeah? Um, not the president, not the Queen of England, nobody, yeah? Which means that here's the thing, here's the rub, right? President puts a thing in a public agenda but cannot force Congress to do anything, to deal with anything, yeah? The only power is he, the president has is indirect, it's a tremendous one, to put pressure on, on them, talking to the public directly and saying, hey, Congress should be doing this, they're not doing it. They're not doing their job, yeah? And that forces Congress to deal with certain issues, for example. Or if the president has good relationship with the Congress, then even then, you know, uh, they need to persuade them to, to do what they want. And a famous example of, of failure is, uh, unfortunately, you know, in terms of, you know, historical failures, was that of Jimmy Carter, who was a Democratic president who had a Democratic majority both in the House and in the Senate and could not get his agenda through. Because why? Because 
be, he might be the occupant, occupant of the position of president, but Jimmy Carter or any president is not the boss of the party. Nor are they, nor are they the bosses of any member of the House or any member of the Senate. Yeah? It's always based on, 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 on persuasion at the end of the day. A persuasion, compromise, blackmail, whatever. Yeah? The point being that uh, you need to, to understand this system yeah? and to use it right. Okay, so only a member of the House uh, of the given chamber can introduce a bill. Um, they, so they introduce it. Uh, in the House it's given to the clerk and uh, in the Senate it's given to the presided, presiding officer. And each bill receives name and number. For example, HR, which is House Resolution, yeah? year slash number yeah in that session of that year this is so you know in the session this year session meaning when congress sits in session this is bill number 200 the 200th bill and that's that's how that bill will be known now of course they might give them other names later but that's kind of how they systematize this okay so this is interesting because they're going to introduce a bill but um um Anyone can, I mean, any member of the Congress can introduce a, 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 a bill, right? Um, any member of the House, any member of the Senate, they have the right to introduce a bill. And in fact, out of the about, you know, out of all the bills uh, introduced, it's interesting to note that only about 10% of the bills actually become law. Uh, 90% never go anywhere. Uh, well, let's think a little bit why. Uh, oh, by the way, so the bill receives a name and number, and also the sponsors of the bill are, the name of the sponsors uh, of the bill will be in the document, meaning the representatives or the senators who stand, who introduce that bill. Those are the sponsors of the bill, yeah? Because usually it's more than one. And this ties into what we need to talk about. Um, why would you have more than one sponsor on a bill? Why not just one name, the person who wants to introduce it? Why do 90% of the bills never go anywhere? Because the whole process, right, of passing a bill in a, in a, in a system which relies on, you know, uh, majorities to pass, yeah, in each chamber, the whole process is about building coalitions. It's about building putting together all the necessary building blocks that will assure that at every single point your piece of legislation will be will pass the next stage, the next obstacle. The first obstacle, as you see, will be when it gets to the committee uh, under which it falls, and they need to deal with it, and they need to pass it, and, uh, uh, and so on. So the point is that when you introduce a bill, you're not just going to introduce it and say, well, fingers crossed, let's see what works. Yeah? In, in, especially in normal times, let me put it this way. The process of building the coalition that will eventually pass this bill. Yeah? Using what? Using, let's say, the, your majority, your member of the majority party. You're going to talk to the leader, talk to the whip, get them behind this because, you know, it needs to be put on the agenda first of all. They're going to help you put it on the agenda. Then you need to talk with them. Then you need to talk to the people in the committees where this bill will go and to the subcommittees where this bill will go. go. And, and point being, you need to build, yeah? You need to build that coalition before you introduce a bill, if this is a bill that has any chance of passing. Otherwise, you're introducing a bill that, well, why do you introduce it? And that's a good question. Because, as I said, 90% never go anywhere, which means that 90% of the bills are introduced by people who have not done the legwork to create majorities, or who couldn't create such majorities. Let's say they were a member of the minority party, whatever. It's just they couldn't, you know, they couldn't force the other people to play along. So when a bill is introduced, the, the, the sponsors, those who introduced it, and the parties and whatever, they kind of know where this will go. They kind of know if this will pass or not. Broadly speaking, there can be, you know, some famous <coughs> cases in which, you know, and, you know, oh, this can always, things can always change and you can always still add the majority to the, to the coalition and whatever. 
But to start with, if you, if you really um, uh, 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 want to, to introduce a bill that is, will become a law, by the time you have introduced the bill, you have built the coalition that will pass the bill. And you have built the relationships and you have, uh, you know, greased the, 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 tra the trajectory of the bill from <coughs> introducing it to going to committee, subcommittee, back to committee, full floor, and passing it in the full floor. So those 90% who introduce it, they kind of know that it's never going to, they're never going to be anything. So then why do they introduce it? Well, this is a good way of building a record, isn't it? Because remember, everything, you know, uh, your work in Congress, yeah, is recorded. But your work means you stand up and say things, yeah, you're, you're taking positions, or, all right, meaning you're fighting the good fight and whatever. Or you're introducing pieces of legislation um, uh, uh, to, to achieve certain things. Um, or you're voting against certain things. Yeah? Those are the ways to show your work to people. Yeah? I have tried to change the law. I have voted against that law. Uh, uh, and so on. Um, so a lot of bills are introduced simply to show to create a record, although you know exactly that no chance in hell would this bill pass, but you can go home and say, hey, brothers and sisters, I have done my part. Congress was just mad, and they wouldn't, wouldn't pass my idea. Yeah? Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we have, <coughs> uh, you know, about 90% ever go anywhere. They were not meant to. Uh, and those 10% who go anywhere, the, 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 the process of, of Creating that majority happens basically already before it's, the bill is introduced. Okay, and as I said, then it goes to the, the so once it goes, it is introduced, right? The third stage will be that of committee work, yeah? And um, here, um, as, as we have discussed, um, each bill needs to go to the committee or committees under whose jurisdiction it falls. Yeah, and so jurisdiction is important. And in the how uh, uh, um, right uh, because it, it needs to go to the specific committee. Now, most pieces of legislation are very complex and they involve issues that have to do with more than just like narrowly one policy area, one subfield. Yeah. There can be a part of it that falls under agriculture, but another part that falls under energy and commerce. And another part that, that will need to go to appropriations because you need to give, we propose uh, giving f farmers money. Uh, so the point is that the bill will be sent to, to actually more than one institution, but you need it, you know, that's the nature of the, uh, more, uh, of, the, of the beast, yeah? The issues are complex, so they need to, the bill will go to several committees. In the, um, based on their jurisdiction. In the House, as I said, the, the, the Speaker of the House plays an important role in assigning bills to committees, but also telling them where to go. Um, in, the, in the Senate, as a, as a general rule, um, in the Senate, things are more collegial, right? So when these are decided, they're decided, as I said, by the majority leader, but probably in collaboration and conversation with the minority leader. Anyway. So the bill is sent to the given committee. So in the committee, what happens? So in the committee, the first thing is the chair decides whether or not to even pick up the, the bill. Yeah, whether or not, uh, to even discuss the bill. And he has the power to say no. The chair, the chairman of the given committee. That's, they're very powerful. Remember when I told you about how, why the civil rights legislation was ne not passed for a hundred years? Because all the chairmanships of the important committees were dominated, were occupied by the most senior members in the Senate, and they were the members from the southern, from the south, from the Democratic South, um, and they were against civil rights. And they had this key position of chairmanships of committees. So even if the numbers would have been positive, uh, they blocked even discussing such bills. 
Uh, so chairmen, uh, chair, chairpersons have a huge uh, power over uh, deciding on interest in discussing a bill or not. Then uh, the bill actually doesn't, is not actually, well, the bill is actually sent to a subcommittee because that's where the work actually begins and, and ends, uh, uh, well, the initial work yeah, on a bill. That right, and these subcommittees are part of the larger committee and are specialized. Like you know, agriculture, there's subcommittee on forestry, subcommittee on um, uh, you know uh, livestock and whatever there was there and, and 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 whatever. So this bill needs to go to the right subcommittee, also made of member of the Congress, also having a majority faction and a minority faction, and also having a chair. Um, so the chairman of the full committee decides whether or not to pick up and even discuss this um, piece of legislation, then the piece of legislation is, is sent either uh, sent to the given subcommittee. So in subcommittee is where the work, the actual work is actually doing, done. Uh, meaning they have a reading, uh, don't want to go into too much detail here, uh, of the text, then they have markup, which is what? Um, this is when they work on the text of the, of, the, um, uh, of the actual piece of legislation that was introduced. So they have, they hold hearings, yeah? Famously hearings with what? Specialists, People from the field, uh, uh, anyone who will be affected by this bill. So, you know, just like in a court case, which this is not, you know, uh, it's like having two sides. Yeah, uh, because those who, the, in the hearings, you will have some people being invited by, let's say, uh, those who want to pass the bill and, and the other ex experts, yeah being inv invited by the faction that doesn't want to pass the bill, yeah? Um, so you're going to hear both of them. So hearings, yeah, stakeholders, yeah. And then you have the markup proper, meaning to working on amending the bill. Amendments, writing the bill, yeah? So that's the process. You, you, you want to get feedback from people uh, from the field and then you work on the, uh, working on the text, yeah? Um, uh, uh, bringing, um, you know, writing, uh, adding amendments, uh, writing the bill, and so on, yeah? Uh, and then when they have worked on this, and this happens, what? Here, the role of what? Staff is important, and there will be committee staff. He, uh, there's um, there's the representative's own staff. And then there's these uh, congressional offices like GAO, CBO, yeah, CRS. All of them, yeah, uh, can get involved in this process because I'm going to ask for some research from CRS. I'm going to ask CBO to do an estimate of the cost of this bill. I'm going to ask um, um, uh, GAO to uh, uh, to um, make sure to tell me that if the previous program was truly, uh, you know, performed well, uh, other specific needs and so on. By the way, uh, specialist person, experts, so it's experts, persons from the field, uh, stakeholders, um, and members of the federal administration, yeah, are asked, are asked to, to um, uh, come in, meaning 
um, the people from the executive who implement these pieces of legislation to give you good feedback. So experts, stakeholders, federal administration members. Okay. And then there is a vote in the ones they have uh, agreed and, and you know, worked on the text. There is a vote in the subcommittee, yeah, uh, which, uh, remember, in each subcommittee, the majority party has a majority, the minority has a minority. Um, the um, vote then, again, this is about coalition building and you need to have a majority, yeah. Of course, if you have the part, if you vote along party lines, <coughs> it didn't used to be all that way, uh, always that way, but now it's more and more polarized, so it's harder not to vote along party lines. Then, um, you know, you have an assured majority in the, in the subcommittee. Anyway, there is a vote, and it's a yes or no. And if it's a yes, then it goes back to... full committee. Okay, back to full committee. Yeah, and in the full committee they have several choices. Yeah, they have several choices. They can do their own markup, right? So reading markup with the same idea, right? Hearings, amendments, writing bill. Yeah. Um, and then now, they might or might not want to do the markup. Maybe they're satisfied with the work done in the uh, <coughs> subcommittee. The rest, though, so they might do or they might not do it. But anyway, one thing they need to do is vote. Again, yes or no. Yes or no. Yeah. And again, in the committee, remember, there's a majority party, there's a minority party. So again, if this is voted along party lines and you're part of the majority party, then your idea might become, uh, you know, might be passed by the committee. And then, from the committee, it goes out to the um, uh, floor. Is it step number four on the full floor of the house? Yeah, and um, and it's because remember, although the work of working on a bill is happens in the committee, for a bill to become a law, it needs to be passed by the full body. Yeah, so we created committees as as, as Congress in order to delegate the actual work. But the approval legally can only be done, yeah, by the whole big thing, yeah. And just to synthesize these, and hopefully in the hope that, that this has been uh, uh, fairly clear, right, so, um, you know, a bill is introduced into the House, yeah, by a member of Congress. Yeah, let's say it's the House, and here's the Speaker, and the Speaker sends it to a given committee, Committee on Agriculture, yeah, where the chair where the chair says yes, no, yeah? Uh, in the Committee on Agriculture, it needs to go to the specified committee that I've never heard, the uh, specified committee within the committee, yeah? Specified committee, yeah, Committee on Agriculture, yeah? And here's the specified committee on, let's say, livestock, yeah? This is where it's, and then here's where the markup is happening and uh, hearings and everything else. And... Um, Sorry, and um, 
And then once they approve it, here's where the work is done. Then they send it back to the full committee, which can do their own markup, and they need to approve it, and then it is sent back to the full house, yeah? And then the full house basically takes a decision on the thing, yeah? The point is that this is a delegation of responsibilities. I introduced a bill in the, in the house, well, where, who should work on this bill? The people specialized on agriculture, meaning that committee on agriculture, yeah? The members of the house who are part of the committee on agriculture, with the help of all that staff, yeah? Well, in the agriculture, again, the same conundrum. There are too many of us, too many things to do. Let's create a smaller group of us that only does things about forestry. And then that's where we send it in the committee. However, they work it, they vote it. And then the committee, as such, has the power to uh, look at it, amend it, or and take a vote. And if you say yes, then it goes to the full house where they they will also they will take a vote. However, uh, can there be new amendments brought in on the full floor? Um, uh, there's no hearings on the full floor anymore, right? But can there be amendments brought on the full floor? Can there be debate on the full floor? Well, that depends, and here's where important differences occur between the House uh, and the Senate, uh, because by tradition the House is, an, uh, is a more regimented institution because of the size, yeah. It needs to be more regimented and with less freedom for, ind for individual uh, members, while the Senate traditionally uh, has been the more you know, noble-like uh, uh, institution where individual senators have tremendous power and leisure and uh, um, uh, space to do what they want. So when we talk about what happens on the floor, yeah, actually we're going to have to talk separately about what happens in the House and what happens in the Senate on the floor. But that's something to be, to be discussed in the next, uh, in the next uh, lecture. So in the next lecture we will uh, finish discussing the lawmaking process and we will uh, quickly uh, cover um, oversight, the oversight function of Congress. And that will conclude the Partisan Congress section of this um, class.